Lord God, truly you are to be adored. We thank you for this Christmas time season. We thank you for the birth of Jesus. And we know that he came to die in our place. And we thank you that you were willing to do that, that you were willing to send your son, Lord God, and that Jesus, you were willing to die for each one of us. Lord, help us to realize that Christmas is about Christ. It's about what you've done for each and every one of us. And Lord, we pray that you would... Uh, Grant us the peace that each of us looks for as we seek to serve you, to follow you, to be the people that you've called us to be. Thank you for the great king that you are and your willingness to be born in a stable. We pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds to spiritual truths, especially in this upcoming year. Help us to see things for what they really are, to see things how you see them. For we know that your ways are not our ways. We need to be in tune with you. So open our hearts and our minds to your word now as uh, Dave brings the message and help us to be open to learn from you and to walk more closely with you, especially in this Christmas season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
chapter 2. Uh, we're going to look at verses 1 through 12 this morning. Matthew chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 12. Uh, before I get into this text, I just want to share something funny. I went to Kroger last night. And they said, <laughs> Buy gifts for my wife. No, 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 no. Walmart, excuse me, Kroger on Christmas Eve is like Walmart on a Friday night, okay? And you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. All the jokes are true, whatever. But that's what's funny is I went to Kroger last night and I walked in on the right side where Fred Meyer's Jewelers is, right? And as I walked there, I looked to my right and there's nothing but guys in the store. <laughs> charging them higher prices, and they're making a killer profit, I'm saying. So hopefully some ladies are happy today. So anyways, um, anyways, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. The title of the message is Worship the King. That is essentially what we are doing when we are thinking about Christmas and the narrative of Jesus putting on humanity and coming and living a perfect life. For instance, when we think about the word worship, what does it actually mean? Because Every one of us this Sunday morning would say that I worship God, and what typically goes through our mind is, is that I articulated words in some type of rhythm to God that talk about God and what He has done for me. What does worship actually mean? For instance, when we think about the word praise and the fact that we are praising God, what we are doing is recounting everything that God has done on our behalf. It is focusing on God's faithfulness towards us. So I'm praising God, not because of my own merit or what I have. It has everything to do with who God is and His attributes. And so I'm praising Him for His faithfulness towards me. However, when we think about the word worship, what typically goes through our mind is a physical posture. When we think about worship, we think about bowing or kneeling down. We also may think about offering up certain gifts or giving in church. But worship also has the meaning of complete surrender to God. And it has to do with our lives as believers that we must surrender to God. And when I am surrendering to God, what I'm actually doing is using my life to worship God. See, you can say that you worship God and you sing to God, but that is not the only aspect of worship. Worship has everything to do with how you live for the kingdom of God. And worship, of, worship is reserved for God alone. You realize that, right? The Bible tells you that you're not allowed to worship anything else except for God alone. And so when we think about worshiping the King, and we think about Jesus, and we think about Christmas, what we need to realize is this the narrative of Jesus' birth should drive us to praise and worship God because of everything that He has done for us. Because through the person and work of Jesus Christ, once and for all, God has provided a perfect sacrifice for my sins. What He has done through Jesus is He has given me an opportunity to be reconciled to God through the birth, life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the true meaning of Christmas that we miss out on many times. It has everything to do with Jesus and Him coming to this earth on behalf of sinful people. Amen. Let's not forget that when we are looking at Christmas and how we should celebrate Jesus. It's interesting, when you read Matthew's Gospel, Matthew gives us a completely different perspective on the life of Jesus. Every one of the Gospels has a theme, but Matthew's Gospel is very Jewish in its presentation. When Matthew is writing his Gospel, he's showing us many Old Testament quotations showing us that Jesus is the promised Messiah from the Old Testament. There are prophecies, there are types and shadows that are pointing to the fact that David's son, Jesus Christ, is going to come on the scene. For instance, last week we looked at the Gospel of Luke, and Luke begins his Gospel by looking at John the Baptist and his parents, Zacharias and Elizabeth, and that entire narrative, and then we have the genealogy. But in Matthew's Gospel, he goes directly into this genealogy, and he's telling his audience, Guys, look, this is the one that has been promised. This is the Messiah. This is the one who is going to come and atone for the sins of the people. This is all the sacrifices that we did in the Old Testament. Look, he is here before us, and that is what Matthew is wanting to present, and this is the King of the Jews that we have been waiting for and anticipating 
By the time we get into Matthew's Gospel, when we get into the time of Jesus, there was this anticipation that some type of Savior was coming on the scene. If you read many of the Jewish writings, if you read many of the Roman writings, these extra biblical resources, you will see author after author saying that they were anticipating some type of Savior, some type of ruler, someone that the people would look up to. It is interesting that Jesus would be born at this time. Again, when we look at Matthew chapter 2, we have to remember these verses. This happens months after Jesus has been born. And we're going to focus on these wise men coming to seek out Jesus. Uh, for instance, we are going to look at the fact that when you look at the nativity scenes, you typically see three wise men, right? Well, the Bible doesn't say there were three wise men. The Bible just says there were wise men. And many times people get three wise men because of the gifts that were offered, gold, frankincense, and we're, we're going to talk about the significance of those things. So let's look at verse 1 of Matthew chapter 2. The Bible says this. It says that now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king. Last week we looked at Herod's life. Herod was not a descendant of Jacob. Herod was a descendant of Esau. Uh, Herod was a man who was known for being a great builder. He was a great innovator, but he was also a very cruel man who even had many of his family members executed. He was not a very stable man. So when the wise men come seeking out Jesus and they say, where is he, the king of the Jews? He does not receive this with a very happy uh, demeanor. He's actually very upset about this. Because he is the king of the Jews. But Matthew begins after his genealogy and after Jesus has been born. Matthew says that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod. What is the significance of Bethlehem? Here's what it is. I can tell you what it isn't. Bethlehem was not a big population. Matthew was not, a, excuse me, Bethlehem was not this big bustling city. It was not like, you know, New York City or San Francisco or, or some of the big cities that we see around the world. Bethlehem was actually a small town. For instance, a description that we have by William Barclay, he says this, Bethlehem was the ancestral home of David, the great king of Israel, and founder of their royal dynasty. However, it was not a large or significant town. Bethlehem was quiet, a little town six miles to the south of Jerusalem. In the olden days, it has been called Ephrath or Ephrathah. First Samuel chapter 1, verse 4, it talks about how Samuel uh, went to Jesse's house seeking the next king of Israel. And the Bible says this, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. So Samuel did what the Lord said, and went to Bethlehem. Something else about Herod is that Herod died around 4 BC and Jesus is born before Herod's death. So we get a context and we get an understanding of what is happening here. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. It is not a significant town, but it has great meaning in the Old Testament. When, when Saul disobeyed God, God goes to Samuel and says, Go to the house of Jesse because I have chosen a king among his sons. And I can tell you that that reference was not only for David. I believe God was telling Samuel that the Messiah was going to come from the loins of David himself. Yes, we are going to go to David. Yes, he's going to be the next king of Israel. But it is David's son that is going to rule over his people. Now think about something for a second here when you think about Bethlehem. Don't want to dwell on this too long, but I still want to go here. Think about what is happening here. As the wise men, as they come, when you think about Jesus being born in Bethlehem and the wise men that are coming and seeking him out, think about the significance of this. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. And if you were to drop into Bethlehem right now and you were to walk those streets, you would look at it and say, you know what? These are the same streets that David walked. This is probably the same route that you know Samuel was taking as he was walking through Israel looking to Jesse's house. This is where David lived. And you remember in Luke's Gospel where it talks about the fact that the angels come to the shepherds and say, Go look, this is he who is to be born. 
And there was much rejoicing at that time. So think about what the gospel writers are saying. They're saying, guys, look, Bethlehem, this is where Jesus was born. But also remember, 900 uh, B.C., you had David who was walking these same streets. Oh, you look at all those shepherds where the angels went and announced that Jesus had been born. Those were the same fields where David himself was a shepherd. I don't think these gospel writers do this by accident. They're trying to draw attention to this. Here's something else that's interesting about this. Is that Samuel, when he's going to the, the sons of Jesse looking to pick out David, it is God that is speaking to him and saying, Nope, I don't want this one. Nope, I don't want this one. Nope, I don't want this one. And then he finally finds David and he said, This is it. He says, because this is someone who has a heart that is obedient towards me. Here's what's interesting. God spoke to Samuel and said, David is the chosen one. In the New Testament, you have a voice from heaven that says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You have these pictures, you have these prophecies that are being played together here to show us that Jesus is the fulfillment. The one that they were waiting for in terms of the Messiah. So Matthew says that Jesus was born in Bethlehem during the time of King Herod. And it says this, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. There is something very cool about this aspect. Don't simply look at this, read past it, because there is such great meaning. It's almost as if God had orchestrated it, right? It's almost like God had an intention behind it, right? It, it's it's kind of like, wow, God, you kind of put all these accidents together and they just kind of worked out. That's not how it was. It was all according to the plan of God. The Bible says, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. If you look at the word wise men, it is an ancient Greek word which we usually say is magi or magi. And it says that they came from the east. Now if you look at some of the original language, here's what it means. The word literally means from the rising of the sun. And the reference generally is to the ancient orient. Now, when I say the ancient Orient, it's talking about nations that are east of Jerusalem. So the nations that they probably had in mind here were the nations such as the Assyrians. It is where we have nations like modern-day Syria and Iraq. Now, you may say to me, well, what is the significance of you telling us that these wise men, not kings, wise men were coming from the east, and they were coming to Israel to worship. What is the significance of them coming from the land of Assyria? You know, modern day, you know, you think about modern day uh, Iran, and you think about modern day Syria, here's what the significance is. Is not only were they true magi, but they had also been deeply influenced by Judaism, quite possibly <coughs> by the writings of Daniel. Now, now, I want you to think about that concept here. When you look at Daniel's narrative, many times when we look at the Jewish people, we say, oh man, how sad that they disobeyed God over and over again. They weren't obedient to Him. They weren't faithful to Him. This is who received all the covenants and promises. And they were taken away into captivity. And here you have Daniel who is serving in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. He is faithful to God. He is worshiping God. And he is serving in the context of these empires in the Old Testament. Daniel ended up becoming governor. And his influence was seen in the lives of these magi that came from the east. They had come from the east and they came to Jerusalem. These wise men were not kings, but rather astronomers who came, who come several months after Jesus is born. Another note says this, in later centuries down to New Testament times, the term magi loosely covered a wide variety of men interested in dreams, astrology, magic books, thought to contain mysterious references to the future and the like. There was something that had picked their interest. They had come to Jerusalem. There was something that was the driving force behind why they had come. Charles Spurgeon says this. He says, A stir begins as soon as Christ is born. He has not spoken a word. He has not wrought a miracle. He has not proclaimed a single doctrine. But when Jesus was born at the very first, while as yet you hear nothing but infant cries, and can see nothing but infant weakness, still His influence upon the world is manifest. 
When Jesus was born, there came wise men from the east and so on. There is infinite power even in an infinite, an infant Savior. I want you to think about something for a second here. What would drive wise men to come to see this child? You know, if you're in trouble and you're struggling, you don't say, well, I'm going to go talk to that baby because that baby's going to give me answers. <laughs> Unless you're really crazy, okay? Unless you're just strange. And you know this world is full of strange people. So why would you go to a child? Why would you, someone who was an astronomer, someone who had great knowledge in foretelling the future, why would you come out and seek this child? You would seek this child because this child is the eternal Son of God. This child is the one who has always been. This is the child who will always be. These wise men had come from the east, possibly influenced by Daniel that there was a Messiah coming. There was much anticipation at that time that there was some type of Savior. And they were coming out to seek God and to worship God. See, don't you think that they were kind of going contrary to their culture a little bit? <laughs> they, they weren't really living in, you know, Christian worlds and in these empires that were there in the Old Testament that were constantly battling the people of Israel. But they said, you know what? We have seen this. We are going to Jerusalem because we have been influenced by these writings and we are going to go out and seek this child. Look at what verse 2 says. And when they, had, when they were on their way, they were saying... Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. I want you to look at verse 2 and I want you to look at the phrase king of the Jews because this is going to get some kind of negative reaction from Herod later on. But think about the, what is going on here. They come from the east. They have traveled for months. Okay, this happens way after Jesus has been born. They have been traveling for months. And they come to Jerusalem, and the Bible says that they went throughout Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born, King of the Jews? Now don't miss out on verse 2, and don't miss out on the word saying. S-A-Y-N-G. Now some of you say saying, okay? Some of you say saying, it's saying, okay? Um, think about this, in the original language it means that they were questioning everyone in town regarding the birth of Jesus. It wasn't like they were really private. You know, like when you are at a grocery store and you, you know someone that you had conflict with in the past and you kind of try to walk the other way real silently, right? You avoid them. You know, don't act like you don't do this because you do it all the time. You know, you have a history with that person. You got into an argument. It's been a while. And the moment you see them, you kind of go like this. And just kind of like, you're really slow like that. I hope they don't see me. I hope they don't see me. <laughs> it's not what the wise men were doing. The wise men were filled with such hope and joy that they had traveled for months and they come to Jerusalem and they're probably knocking on doors saying, hey, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? You don't know? Okay, we'll go over here. They had gone throughout Jerusalem questioning everyone regarding the birth of Jesus. Because after all, this was Israel. If anyone should know where this king was to be born, it should be them. Here's what's interesting is they say that we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. The word star, many people have different interpretations on what this could be. It can refer literally and figuratively to an object as having great brilliance or radiance. It was a supernatural thing is the conclusion that I've come to. It was something supernatural created by God for this specific purpose. And they said that they had been following this star for months and now they were coming to worship Him. Adam Clark says about the word worship, he says this, it means to prostrate oneself to another according to the Eastern custom which is still in use. In this act, the person kneels and puts his head between his knees, his forehead at the same time touching the ground. It was used to express both civil and religious reverence. They are being secretive about their intentions. They are seeking Jesus because they want to bow before the King. 
See, here's what it tells me about these wise men, is that they were not making their faith and their hope and their excitement a secret. They had every intention of worshiping. You as a Christian that lives in a secular world, you need to make your intentions clear about whether you truly want to worship God or not. Amen. Don't, don't go around and say, well, yeah, you know, someone asks you about your faith and talks about Jesus. Yeah, you know, I go to church here and there. Yeah, and then when you come to church, you know, you're praising God and you're reading your Bible, acting as if you worship God all week. God does not want secret Christians. He wants people that are excited about following Him. People who want to worship Him. People who are out there saying, I am not ashamed to be called a Christian, and I'm willing to follow my Savior, even if it costs me my reputation. They had come from the East. They had come to Jerusalem. They made their intentions clear. They were talking about it. We want to kneel before Him. We want to worship Him. I love verse 3. It says this, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all <coughs> Jerusalem with him. Now, think about something here for a second. Herod being troubled had a lot to do with the political climate of the time. There was a group of people called the Parthians. You know, when you have time, look them up a little bit later on. The Romans and the Parthians were always in contention. The Parthians uh, were occupying part of that land, and the Romans come in, and they kick them out of the land. And as a result of this, many of the Parthians that were there from the, if you think about uh, the Iran at that time, the empire, they were kind of scattered throughout Jerusalem, and they were even scattered outside of Jerusalem. And there was this constant tension between them. And the Bible says this, that Herod, when he heard that these men had come from this region seeking to find out who was the king of the Jews, he was troubled. Because he's thinking to himself, who is trying to overthrow my authority? Who is trying to challenge me? He was under much political pressure. Now, not just that, but look at this. It says, all of Jerusalem. The Magi had gone place to place asking about a king, and that may have stirred up the city. How many of you know people that like to go from person to person, and when they don't like an answer, they just keep going? Right? They, they, they just keep going because they don't like the answer that has been given them. But think about this in this respect. Uh, do, do we do this in our excitement about spreading the joy of Christ? Can, can people look at you and say, you know, can you read that back and say, you know what, when so-and-so person from Crosspoint Church went to their workplace, all of their workplace was wondering, wow, where does this person come from with their faith? Mm -hmm. I have people been talking about you, not in a negative way, because I can tell you this, there's a way to be uh, basically a jerk in terms of being a Christian towards people. And then there's a loving way to do it, where you're gracious, where you're kind and you're compassionate. These men had stirred up all of Jerusalem because in their mind they're thinking to themselves, what are you talking about when you are saying the word king? Because we already have a king. Well, who, who exactly are you referring to? And they probably started talking. So this whole place is stirred up. Here's a note here that says not only were they concerned about this new king, but also how an unstable man like Herod would react to the news. And you know what Herod does a little bit later on. He slaughters all children, male, two years and under, because of this insecurity. A man, a grown man, a king, is threatened by the presence of a child. Think on that for a second. Look at verse 4. It says, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. What does he do? He, he gathers all the experts. He's saying, you know what? These wise men have come. They're asking, who is the king of the Jews? You know, so he gets all the experts in the law. He gets the priests and he comes to them asking them who exactly is this person. So the first group that he gets is a group of priests. These were from the priestly tribe of Levi. Number two, he also grabs chief priests. These were captains of the temple that had been appointed by and responsible to the high priest. These chief priests had the power to imprison and arrest 
and always had a large group of soldiers who are all Jewish available at his disposal. And not just that, but Herod also grabs the scribes. These were primarily Pharisees, authorities on Jewish law, and were often referred to as lawyers. So he gets the best. He goes out and gets the best. He says, if I am going to be looking into who this Messiah is, if I'm going to be looking at who is the king of the Jews, I'm going to get the people that know the most about the Old Testament, about the Bible, and I'm going to bring them together, and I'm going to find out. And verse 4 tells us that he inquired of them. Here's what the original language literally means, is that he was constantly asking. He was constantly asking. He was curious. It was on his mind. I want you to think about something about dictators. Okay? <laughs> Look at world history and think about dictators. Do you realize with even all the power that they possessed that they were always insecure and always unstable? Why? Because in the back of their minds they know that their power is only for a short amount of time. That they know that the power that they possess is not going to be everlasting. And so they go and do crazy things, they do stupid things, they do unstable things, uh, and they oppress people in the midst of it. Herod was so baffled by what is going on, his heart was troubled, and all of these guys are standing before him and he is saying, where is he, where is he, where is he, tell me about this, tell me about this, tell me about this. Because in the back of his mind, after all, he was not a believer. If you are not a believer, your soul is always going to be troubled. If you're a believer, you're never going to have peace. If you're, a, if you're not a believer, you're never going to have joy. If you're not a believer, you're always going to be pondering, wondering what's next, what's going to happen. But if you're a child of God, you can have peace. Because you realize that your life is in God's hands. And whatever happens, He is in full control of it. And He's going to do what is good in the midst of that circumstance. Verse 5 says, So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for, you, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. This is a, a, a quotation uh, from, uh, cited from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But look what's interesting about this is that when, when he describes this passage in the book of Micah, he is basically saying that this Messiah is going to be one who is not just a shepherd, but he is also going to be a ruler. He's going to have a dual purpose. So not only does this description of him imply care, but also dominion and power. Uh-oh. Can you imagine Herod sitting there going, Okay, I'm king. I'm asking these guys questions about this Messiah, this king of the Jews. And they give him the description there saying, Hey, Herod, I want you to understand, not only will this Jesus, not only will this Messiah be a shepherd, but he is also going to be a ruler. He's going to rule. He is going to reign. The Jewish leadership acknowledged that a literal and historical Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And the prophecies he would fulfill. If you were to walk into Jerusalem at that time, if you were to grab all the experts of the law, if you were to ask them about Jesus and the coming Messiah, they could give you all the information you wanted. They had these things memorized. They, they had scribes who would write the Old Testament over and over again. They knew all the information. They had head knowledge. But if you only have to look at the Gospels when Jesus is doing his earthly ministry and he encounters the teachers of the law and you realize how much of that head knowledge never really changed their hearts. Now think about the shepherds, for instance. Here's a note in the commentary that says this. He says, had they met with the shepherds of Bethlehem, they, had received, they would have received better intelligence than they could from the learned scribes of Jerusalem. So isn't it interesting that God chooses to reveal himself through lesser things. He is born in Bethlehem, a small town, insignificant from our eyes, but this is where David dwelt. When you think about the fact that he, the angels go to the shepherds and he gives the good news to them, God is operating in the lowly things here. See, if we were to write the narrative of Scripture and the narrative of Jesus, 
We would stick them in a palace. Mary would have no issues and no problems. Everything would be okay. They would have all the luxuries in the world, but yet that is not the way that God chose to write the history and the story in this. He chose the lowliest of circumstances to confound the wisest people in the world. So here's a lesson. God is not interested in necessarily smart people. He's interested in faithful people. God is not interested in your intelligence as much as He is interested in your heart. Because the world is filled with intelligent people. I mean, if you look at your iPhone, right, it can do some amazing things. Okay, you can, you can send text messages across the world. You can take photos and send them. You know, you can record things. You can watch videos on them. You can do so many things. You can take a selfie. <laughs> like, how obsessed have we become with ourselves? We take selfies everywhere. Some of you are like, oh, man, you know, I need to take that Christmas picture now, okay? No, just kidding, just kidding. But you look at how intelligent we are as a people, but yet we are still 100% lost outside of the grace of God. There's nothing that can trade, nothing that can supplant the grace of God. And here we have intelligent people that have great information. And yet when the Messiah stands before them and says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, they say, no way. Verse 7 says, And Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Note here says this, What exquisite hypocrisy was here. He only wished to find out the child, he only wished to find out the child that he might murder him. But see how that God who searches the heart prevents the designs of wicked men from being accomplished. Verse 9, when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, before I get into the aspect of stood over, think about, again, Matthew. Matthew is a tax collector. Matthew is a Jewish man. Matthew is writing his entire gospel from a Jewish lens, showing that Jesus is the one who is fulfilling all the prophecies that were there in the Old Testament about his life, about his coming. And Matthew writes here that when these wise men had seen the star in the east, that went before them. You know, we may just simply read that and say, okay, he's just kind of following them, they're following the star, and then they finally find where Jesus is. What do you think Matthew is implying with some of the language that he is using? It went out before them. If you're a Jewish person, what comes to your mind when you see something going before you? Remember when the people of Israel were in the wilderness? What, what was guiding them? It, it was that pillar of fire by night. It was the cloud by day. What was it doing? It was going out before them. God is showing that he's going to do the same thing in his life, that he goes before his people. The shepherd always goes out before his people. David would always go out before his sheep. Jesus does the same thing for us. He goes out before us and we follow him. He is the shepherd. We are the sheep. We are under His guidance. And the Bible says that this star, it came out and stood over where the young child was. Some notes say that this could not have been an actual star because it came and stood directly over where Jesus and His family lived. We really don't know, but it was some type of luminary in the heavens that they were following. Now we're, think about this idea of literally stood over the head of Jesus. Adam Clark gives a note, he says this, he actually gives two notes. He says, it literally stood over the head of Jesus, this idea of a star-like shine associated with the head of Jesus gave rise to the idea of the halo in ancient and medieval art. You guys ever seen photos of Jesus? Some of the older art, what does it always have? It has a halo around the head of Jesus. Well, this is where the idea comes from. Another note he says about this star, he says, so it appears to have been a simple luminous meteor in a star-like form and a very short distance from the ground. Otherwise, it could not have ascertained the place where the child lay. Whatever it was, God used it to highlight, to show where Jesus was. And the star was going before them and they followed. Now, I love the reaction. 
in verse 10. It says that when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Don't miss out on this. They've been traveling for months, following the star. There was news that this king of the Jews was going to be born, so they had come to Jerusalem. And the Bible says that when they saw the star and the fact that it stood still, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Don't miss out on this because in the Greek language it's called a superlative. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You're like a super what? It's called a superlative and it simply means to be in excess of or to the highest degree. They weren't just simply like this. Oh, there's the star. I'm so glad I traveled all these months to see Jesus. Boy, aren't you glad? Yep, I'm glad. Praise the Lord. <laughs> That's not what they did. They had been traveling for months and they see Jesus and they're probably jumping for joy and rejoicing. They are greatly in an anticipation. They had come and they find Jesus. They're probably hugging each other. They're probably high-fiving. They're laughing. They're probably tears of joy. There was much joy in their soul because they had come to the place where the child was. Their joy could not be contained. Do you experience the same joy when you're following Jesus? Because unfortunately, if you and I look at our lives, many times following Jesus is like, oh man, why did he do this to me? Why do I have another trial? You know, why have these circumstances happened to me? And we start to go become whining Christians, right? We all have a tendency to do that. These men have been following God for months, the star that he had provided, and when they come to this place, they have much joy. It could not be contained. And what is joy manifests, manifests itself, and it's found in verse 11, it says this, And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. That's the result of joy. The result of joy, the end result of joy, is worship. Mm. Contentment in the Lord will always result in worship. Joy in the Lord will always result in the worship. In worship. If you are struggling in your walk with the Lord and you're not walking with the Lord, it's not going to result in worship. It's going to result in bitterness and hatred. That's when we have to do a heart check. Lord, why, why exactly am I feeling this way and why am I not worshiping? Because essentially every single human being is a worshiper, right? Whatever has your affection and your joy and your attention and your adoration, that is what you worship. And many times as Christians, we don't worship God, we worship stuff. Because everything in my life that I'm doing is so that I can gain more things. Whatever is taking up your time and your adoration and your love is what you are worshiping. Don't simply think that you're because you're a Christian that you always worship God because you know it's not true. And they come into the house and they fall down before Jesus and they worship Him. Now you look at verse 11, what's striking about it? Here's what it is. It's to mention the child before the parent went against the custom. See, when you're writing Christmas cards and you're writing it to families, you typically put the parent's name first, right, and then the child. You don't say, you don't, you don't get you send out letters to the child's name first and then the parents. Because you can get a phone call. <laughs> Like, you know, why did you do this? So Matthew writes this, it goes against all customs. He puts, he says that these, these guys, they came to this house, they saw the young child with Mary. And what happened there? It says the reference of a young child means that Jesus was between 6 to 18 months of age. Somewhere in that range, maybe 24. Because we know that Herod goes and kills all children two years and under. So we can estimate that Jesus was not a baby at this time, but he was a young child, but no older than two years old. And they come down and they worship him. Can you imagine the scene for a second? You walk into a house, and there's a child, and you bow down before the child. You don't typically do that. You know, if you were to go to the house of a dignitary, someone who was significantly important, if you were to go into the governor's mansion, man, you would go before the governor and you would shake his hand and you'd say, man, it's such an honor to meet you, you know, you know, thank you for all you do, and you, you would have, praise him with all these accolades. And then if you found their grandchildren, you wouldn't do the same to them. 
You'd say, oh, that's great. I have grandchildren too. That's what you would say. <laughs> but imagine what Matthew is saying to us. He's saying they go into this house, and there is this young child under two years of age, and these wise men, these astronomers, these intelligent men who have traveled for months, they come down and they worship before this child. Folks, can I tell you that even as a child, he was still full, fully God. Amen. 100% God. What the, the God of heaven would choose to do that. And look at what resulted in it even further. It says that when they had opened up their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. There's three gifts that they bring to Jesus. There's significance behind this, and don't miss out on this. Let me run through this real quickly. First thing that they bring is gold. In ancient cultures, not so much today, it is in some countries, but gold in ancient times, it was a precious metal, and as such was very valuable commodity. Its value could very well have financed Joseph and Mary's trip to Egypt. Second thing they bring is frankincense. It is a white resin or gum. It is obtained from a tree by making incisions in the bark and allowing the gum to flow out. It is highly fragrant when burned and was therefore used in worship where it was burned as a pleasant offering to God. Frankincense is a symbol of holiness and righteousness. The gift of frankincense to the Christ child was symbolic of his willingness to become a sacrifice, wholly giving himself up analogous to a burnt offering. Then you have myrrh. Myrrh was also a product of Arabia and was obtained from a tree in the same manner as frankincense. It was a spice and was used in embalming. It was also sometimes mingled with wine to form an article of drink. Well, what's significance about, significant about gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Because when we think about gold, we can say that it signifies royalty. When we think about incense, we can say it speaks of divinity. And when we think about myrrh, we can think about the fact that it is speaking about death. So even in these sacrifices that they bring to Jesus, they were signifying the fact that not only is this fully God, not only is his life going to be offered up as a sacrifice, but he is also going to die. In the gifts that the wise men to bring to Jesus, it is giving us a picture of the earthly ministry of what Jesus would do. Think about also this, that even during a joyous occasion of the birth of Jesus, there was a reminder that the King of Heaven came to earth to die. They're visiting this child. They may not have known uh, that, that this murder or whatever significance there was to death and that this was what's going to happen to so him. They may not have had that in the back of their mind. They knew that this was a child that knew he was going to be king. But Matthew is telling us, guys, don't you see the symbolism behind this? That God is putting on humanity and he's coming to die. Adam Clark notes again, he says this. The people of the East never approach the presence of kings in great percentages without a present in their hands. This custom is often noticed in the Old Testament and still prevails in the East and in some, and in some of the newly discovered South Sea Islands. Last note here again, it says this, How useful this gold was to Joseph in the following months. It helped him to defray the cost of the journey into Egypt and back and to maintain his precious charges there. The Heavenly Father knew what those needs would be and met them by anticipation. The wise men traveled all that way so they could do what they could, worship. Their joy resulted in worship. If you want to be a true worshiper of God, coming to church on a Sunday morning is not going to cut it. You may like to think it does it. You may like to think, oh, that got that checked off my list. Worship is something that you do habitually every single day. Amen. That's right. If you don't wake up in the morning and say that I <laughs> seek to this and I desire to worship God, and you don't make that the focus of your day, you're not going to worship. And so when you come in on Sunday morning, you're kind of going to be in a fog and, and think to yourself, have I reflected on the truth of God's Word? Have I, have I been in fellowship? Have I been in fellowship with God's people? You're going to be in a daze and a fog when you come in and sit on Sunday morning because you have no recollection of worship. But if worship is an everyday thing, 
where you're walking with the Lord, where you're growing in your walk with the Lord, when you come in on Sunday morning, it is almost like the Super Bowl where you're saying, man, this is an expression of my joy to the Lord because of the way that I have been in tune with Him the rest of the week. Amen. The wise men traveled from the east and it resulted in worship. We as Christians have been saved not so that we can do our own thing. We have been saved so that we can worship Jesus Christ. Amen. Let worship of Christ be the focus of our lives. Let us allow Him to go before us so that we can find joy and contentment in Him. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Just in this few moments that we have between you and the Lord, are you a worshiper of God? It's easy for us to say, I come to church and I sing songs. I may sing songs once in a while when I'm in my car during the week, but that doesn't cut it for worship. Worship is being intentional. Worship is habitual. Worship is a constant focus of reverence on God and what He has done for me through the person of Christ. If you're a believer and you're saying to yourself, I have not worshiped the way that I should, make that your focus, not just today, but every single day. You might be sitting in this room and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. You wonder, what is this child all about? This child is about you. This child is about me. This child is a picture of redemption that can only be accepted, that can only be true through His life and what He did for us on the cross and through His resurrection. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, why would you wait another day? This is the greatest gift that anyone can give you, the gift of eternal life. Just in these few moments between you and God.
Phil has been, just to give you an announcement, Phil has been basically heading up a lot of the stuff from, since we purchased our building. He's been our go-to maintenance guy, and he's been, you know, helping us and kind of saying, hey, this is what needs to be done and getting a team together with him. Uh, starting, uh, actually today after when Phil leaves, it'll, it's going to be uh, Don Gray and Roger Cole will kind of be overseeing it. So if you have any questions about maintenance, you're like, hey, this, this may be leaking or this may need to be fixed, go and talk to those gentlemen. Uh, and that way, you don't have to come and ask me. You don't have to ask a hundred different people. So, uh, Roger and Don Gray, where are you at? Don, raise your hand. And Roger's in the back. So, if you can come and see them, that would be greatly appreciated. If you're also, we have directories. If you wanted to get in contact with people, you don't know their number, and you know, you just want to say, hey, what's up? How are you? We have directories in the back. And also, if you're a first-time visitor with us, please stop uh, in the front here counter. We'd love to give you a gift just for your. Visit with us, get to know you more, and thank you for coming and worshiping with us today. So with that being said, let us stand as we dismiss in a word of prayer. Don, if you could please come up and uh, dismiss us, that would be great. Thank you. Father, we just want to thank you for the uh, gift that you gave. Lord, you gave everything. You gave your son and... Uh, we know the wages of sin is, is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we just want to praise you, worship you uh, for what you gave, that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son that we might not perish. And Father, we just want to worship you today, and we might rejoice in this truth today, and Lord, that the love of God might be shed abroad in our hearts to others, that we might uh, give to others. And we just thank you for the message this morning. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Pray that you bless this time and this season we ask in Christ's name. Amen.